Thank you to the Rural Alberta Advantage. You're listening to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast, and I'm your host, Rick Cole. Every week, uh, we come to you from the beautiful Niagara region in Ontario, Canada, and we take you on a journey down memory lane back 50 years ago in time to a period this week to give you all the hockey news from this week, April 6th to April 13th, 1970. This podcast is possible with the support of our two sponsors. Uh, Newspapers.com is the world's largest online newspaper archive, and their support has been crucial to our research. They let us get into all the newspapers in hockey land in 1970 to bring you all these great news items. We're also sponsored by the Breakwall Brewing Company in beautiful downtown Port Colborne, Ontario. The folks at the Breakwall produce outstanding craft beers and the best pub food on the planet, and during this time, they're given some great takeout food, and you can get your beer on a takeout basis as well. When this is all over, make it to Port Colborne, and we'll have a beer and a burger at the Breakwall. Last week's show was probably one of our more interesting episodes for the entire season. Uh, We talked about the wild and crazy week that was the finale of the 1969-70 NHL season. And we found out how it all turned out. And it was a scenario pretty well not to be believed. We learned that this late stage in his career, Pittsburgh Penguins goalie Les Binkley might finally be nearing a decision to don a face mask. And we found out how the great Gordie Howe celebrated his 42nd birthday. Of course, he celebrated it in typical hockey player fashion. This week, some of the stories we're covering are, of course, the NHL, amid widespread complaining on their tie-breaking processes, looked at rule changes to better determine how the winners of playoff races might be figured out in the events of ties. We have Sam Pollock discussing what had been unthinkable, the Montreal Canadiens missing the playoffs, and we talk about the first four games of the 1970 Stanley Cup playoffs. There's a lot of news this week, so I guess we're going to have to get right to it now. We talked about the standings, the final standings of the NHL season last week, but we didn't talk about individual player statistics so we won't go into a great deal of numbers on this but we did want to let you know the final scoring and goal keeping leaders the leading scorer was Bobby Orr of the Bruins with one of the great seasons by any player of all time you got to remember we're just at the end of the 1960s beginning of the 1970s and Bobby as a defenseman led the NHL with an incredible 120 points based on 33 goals, 87 assists, and he also served 125 minutes in penalties. 21 points behind Bobby was his teammate Phil Esposito, who had 43 goals and 56 assists. And then 13 points back of Esposito, Phil, was Makita Stan of Chicago, who had 39 goals, 47 assists for 86 points. In the goalkeeping uh, race for the Vezina Trophy, the Blackhawks won that with an average of 2.24. That's the team average. But Tony Esposito, who played 3,763 minutes, had an average of 2.17 with 15 goals against. The St. Louis Blues, an expansion team, came in in second place with an average of 2.36 with most of the minutes there being eaten up by Jacques Plante with a 2.19 average, and the New York Rangers were third at 2.49, thanks to Eddie Jockerman playing the lion's share there, 4,148 minutes, and his average 2.36 goals against per game. Now you got to remember in those days, they did not even keep the save percentage statistics for goaltenders. So the best we had to go on as far as assessing the performance of a net miner, at least in statistics made public, was that goals against per game average. (laughs) 
So one thing that's certain that the NHL is going to have to make changes to its system of breaking ties to determine the order of finish in the final standings. The league wants to avoid a repeat of that farcical end of the 1969-70 season where teams, two teams in particular, elected to play without goalkeepers during much of the final period of the game in order to run up their own goal totals, completely disregarding a poor goals against record and the defense aspect of the game. National Hockey League Director of Administration Brian O'Neill said that it was his feeling that the league would work out some goals for against ratio to break a possible tie. NHL President Clarence Campbell felt that it, one way to break a tie between two clubs would be to take into account the season record between the two teams. Whoever won the most games between the two tied teams would get the tiebreaker and that seemed to make a lot of sense. Campbell advised that whatever system and whatever changes eventually would be made will have to be decided upon by the National Hockey League Board of Governors starting at the meetings in June. Nothing's going to happen before then. Now those June meetings are shaping up to be one very busy event. You've got the Buffalo Vancouver expansion drafts the first amateur draft where all graduating juniors are freely available to all the teams and there's going to be new rules discussions along with those we're talking about here with tiebreakers. Of course we'll have it all for you in June including all the talk and the rumors leading up to the meetings. What about a regular season overtime session to break a tie at the end? Wouldn't that be exciting? So in the wake of that wild uh, National Hockey League finish, here are the playoff matches for the first round. Chicago Blackhawks, as a result of Phoenix first place in the Eastern Division, are going to play the third place Detroit Red Wings. Runners up Boston Bruins gets the New York Rangers, who barely squeaked into that final playoff berth by outscoring Montreal by just two goals in that crazy tiebreaker that we've been talking so much about. In the Western Division, the first place St. Louis Blues are going to meet the third place Minnesota North Stars, with the North Stars proclaiming they're very happy to take the Blues on right off the bat. In the other series, it'll be the Pittsburgh Penguins slugging it out with the Oakland Seals. Now let's do a quick preview or post-mortem, if you were, with these series and a few of the teams that didn't make it. In Toronto, there really isn't much to say about a Maple Leaf team that rivaled some of their terrible teams back in the desolate 1950s, at least rivaling them for ineptitude. Rookie GM uh, Jim Gregory, as who has yet to see his 35th birthday, is quick to recognize where this club's weaknesses lie, and he's got a plan on how to fix them. Gregory cites the very young and inexperienced Toronto Defense Corps as the team's Achilles heel, and he is not incorrect in that statement. He almost took a huge step near the trade deadline towards addressing that issue when he had a deal worked out with the Flyers to acquire veteran rear guard Ed Van Imp. The trade was almost made, but the Leafs insisted on picking up in that deal one of the Flyers' two young goaltenders, either Doug Favell or Bernie Perrant, and it's known that Gregory much preferred Perrant. The Flyers would not include either of those goalkeepers in the deal, trying to give to Toronto young netminder Dunk Wilson instead. The Flyers wouldn't agree to let Favell or Perrant go. Now the Flyers know that they're going to lose Wilson in the expansion draft if they can't trade him, or they're going to lose one of Perrant or Favell if they don't protect them. My money's on them protecting both of those and getting rid of Wilson. Gregory says that the young rear guards in Toronto eventually will develop into a top flight unit, but he also recognizes that his general manager's position might not afford the time to a patient approach. In other words, Jim's going to be expected to produce and he must do it sooner 
rather than later. Now the Leafs must also shore up the goalkeeping. Johnny Bauer is now retired. Marv Edwards is in his mid-30s and he can't realistically be expected to show a lot of improvement. And Bruce Gamble, who gave the Leafs such yeoman service as their main netminder this season, he's no spring chicken either. There are no young netminders in the Toronto system on um, one who could call a future Johnny Bauer. So the Leafs are going to have to look at their goalkeeping and something is going to have to be done in the not-too-distant future. Montreal Canadiens general manager Sam Pollock is a stand-up guy and he had no excuses when reporters sought a post-mortem on a landmark in a bad way season for the Montreal Canadiens. This is the first time in 22 years that the Habs have missed the playoffs and Pollock said that yes, there were reasons for the Habs' lack of success, but he has no excuses. No excuses at all. So while Sam was taking the high road, saying that he was responsible and it would be fixed. Others in Montreal were not so charitable, especially when it comes to the Detroit Red Wings and their awful performance against the Rangers on the final night of the season. You remember what happened. The Red Wings won Saturday, but did not use their number one goalie, Roy Edwards, in goal for Sunday. They basically rested players like Gordie Howe and Alex Del Vecchio and Frank Mahovlich through much of the game Sunday night, and they ended up losing to the Rangers 9-5. Now, the official line out of the form is that Canadians had 76 games to nail down a playoff spot, and it shouldn't have come down to depending on another club to enable their participation in the Stanley Cup tournament. But the undercurrent, as we all know, of messages out of the Habs executive suite was that if the Red Wings had approached the final game against New York in any other manner than that they could not care less about the game, things might have been different. The Rangers had to score seven goals to avoid elimination, and they got nine. But they fired 65 shots at Red Wings goalie Roger Crozier, who's generally regarded as the second best Red Wings netminder this season. But you couldn't blame Roger Crozier. He gave it everything he had. But 65 shots in a game like that, you're going to have a few goals going in. That performance, by the way, was the best in Ranger history on an offensive uh, effort. Toe Blake who flatly predicted another Stanley Cup for Montreal just a few days before the end of the season, offered a terse, I don't want to talk about it, when he was asked. But you know exactly what he was thinking when he added, I'm afraid what I might say. Now Sam Pollock tried to put things in perspective when he offered this query to reporters. Would you trade the whole Montreal organization for the whole Detroit organization? Sam doesn't believe the Montreal dynasty is completely dead. He could have quite justifiably so used injuries as an excuse for the Habs' downfall this season. But really, that belongs in the list of reasons, not excuses. And Sam never mentioned it. Sam had this to say, though, when people suggested that the reason Canadians missed the playoffs was because they no longer had exclusive access to young French-Canadian players. Sam says that's a myth. He says for only six years we were given priority on the French-Canadian kids in lieu of our normal two draft choices. In the first five years, we only got one player with a chance to make the Canadians. And in the very last year, 1969, we got Mark Tardif and Rajon Uhl. You can be sure of one thing. The Habs will be back, and they will be back soon, and you can bet Sam Pollock has a plan to accomplish that fact. This week, the four playoff series begin, and let's take a look at each of them. Uh, in Boston, the fans there are not happy because the Bruins did not finish first. They finished second behind the Blackhawks. The fans are even more disgusted over the fact that playoff tickets are in short supply. There are only about 2,000 tickets available for the games, and when they went on sale, 
5,000 people showed up at Boston Garden to purchase the ducats with overwhelming numbers pushing, shoving, and even fistfights breaking out while they waited for about three hours to try and get a ticket. One fan was even sustained minor injuries at the point when the throng just broke through the lines and stormed the ticket office. It was an ugly scene, to say the least, and the Bruins fans were as rough on themselves as their team is on the opposition. Now, as far as the Bruins-Rangers series... Uh, We would think it should be a fairly easy win for the Bruins. They were near or at first place all season, and it was only that late surge by the Blackhawks and some shaky play by every Bruins defender but Bobby Orr that uh, enabled Boston to slip out of the front spot into the runner-up slot. The Bruins have Orr healthy. They have some good replacements and players returning to health, and they should be able to take the Rangers. The Rangers, of course, basically backed into the playoffs. They backed in in the weirdest of ways, and we talked about that. General Manager Coach Emil Francis is, as is usually practice, full of confidence. He figures the New Yorkers can give Boston a good run as they return to full health as well as the Bruins. Francis points out that young defenseman Brad Park is looking as good as he ever has in his uh, last two years. And Francis thinks, or is it does he hope, but he thinks that Park can neutralize Orr if such a thing is even possible. The goaltending for the two clubs is about even though. Eddie Jockman of the Rangers might have a slight edge over Jerry Cheevers and Eddie Johnson of the Bruins, but Jockman's play down the stretch when the Rangers were slumping so badly was pretty spotty, and Terry Sawchuk is not, at this stage in his life, a quality backup. Jackman's play probably slipped because he was overused by the Rangers all season. That's where the Bruins have an advantage. Cheevers and Johnson split the duties fairly evenly over the season. Uh, Cheevers was hot and cold, but if you know Jerry, he's a big game player and he relishes the chance to perform on the big stage. New York uh, ticket sales were brisk as well as Boston, by the way. Their playoff tickets that were available sold out in about an hour. The other Eastern Division series see Chicago and Detroit square off, and to us, at least at the beginning of the series, it looks like a mismatch. The Red Wings' defense has been deteriorating badly since the All-Star break, and they won't be able to contain that vaunted Chicago offense led by Bobby Hull and Stan Makita. On the Red Wings' blue line, Gary Bergman, he's the best they have. He's looked pretty tired, slowing down, and uh, Carl Brewer who seemed to be at an all-star level all season, has been either disinterested or distracted, and he hasn't played at all well down the stretch. The other Red Wing defensemen are basically journeymen, although Dale Rolfe, who was acquired from the Kings right near the trade deadline, he's been steady since he was picked up. The Red Wings have some good offensive pieces, led by young Gary Unger and veterans Alec Dalvecchio, Frank Mahovlic, and Gordy Howe. But those players, they can't match the Chicago output. That's going to come from, of course, Dennis and Bobby Hull, Stan Makita, Pitt Martin, Jim Pappen, Cliff Coral, and quite a few others. The Chicago Blue Line Corps was greatly enhanced by that late season acquisition of Bill White from the Kings. And the goalkeeping has quite simply been the best in the NHL, thanks to the season that was had by spectacular rookie Tony Esposito. The Chicago net mining actually got stronger with the addition of Jerry Desjardins, who came to Chicago with Bill White from the Kings. This series should be no contest. Out west, the first place St. Louis Blues will tangle with the Minnesota North Stars, and realistically, there shouldn't be any team in the Western Division that can successfully challenge St. Louis. The Blues are a veteran squad, and if anything, they could tire a bit, but they have the best goalkeeping, a balanced offense, and a tough, mean defense that can also move the puck when they have to. Scotty Bowman, the Blues coach, knows how to run a bench as well as anyone. 
The North Stars, with the addition of Gump Worsley, have very solid net minding, but their blue line core is not in the same class as the Blues. They have some very good offensive pieces in Bill Goldsworthy, who might not be entirely healthy, Claude LaRose, J.P. Parise, and Danny Grant, but they'll need to get close to the St. Louis goal to even have a shot at beating one of Glenn Hall, Jacques Plant, or even rookie Ernie Wakely, and that won't happen enough to make a difference. The other Western Division series has the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Seals squaring off. They're two pretty evenly matched teams, I think, and a couple of highly regarded coaches behind the benches in Red Kelly of the Penguins and the Seals' Freddie Glover. Red Kelly just seems to be able to get the maximum effort from this team this season, and what he's done with star rookie Michel Briere is quite remarkable. This kid has come out of nowhere to be regarded as a budding superstar and he has the talent and charisma to make it big and he's a guy that could really put hockey on the map in Pittsburgh and goodness knows this franchise needs it. This series might come down to goalkeeping. Gary Smith, big tall Gary Smith, is the main man for the Seals. He's talented And he has a ferocious win-at-all-cost attitude. But Gary is also known as quite the free spirit. And sometimes his wanderlust and unorthodox thinking can be costly. Gary needs to be consistent. The Penguins will go with either young Al Smith, who's had a breakout season for Pittsburgh, or the veteran Les Binkley, who finally seems to be returning to health and will be participating for the first time in his life in the Stanley Cup playoffs. If Les is on his game and he's healthy, he might turn the tide for the Penguins, but realistically, I think this series is too close to call. Red Kelly actually might just be the difference. So by the end of this week, believe it or not, four games will have been played in the Stanley Cup playoffs in each series. The series began on Wednesday evening, and then they played again the very next night, Thursday. There's no alternating night or nights off or divisions alternating in the NHL of the 1970s. They got the games done in rapid fire, and really, when you look back, it was quite a challenge for teams. It's a good thing there were only three steps to the Stanley Cup tournament back in those days. Now, Wednesday evening... The Blackhawks hosted the Red Wings in the first game of Series A, as they called it, and they took a 4-2 win over the Red Wings to absolutely no one's surprise. Pitt Martin, Stan Makita, Chico Mackey, and Eric Nesterenko scored the goals for the Hawks, and Tony Esposito made 35 saves as he had a surprisingly busy night in goal for Chicago. Robert Marcus, he's a sports columnist with the Chicago Tribune, usually writes about all other sports, but every once in a while he pays a little bit of attention to hockey. He exemplified the enthusiasm and confidence in the Chicago Blackhawks when he wrote that Chicago was so strong and played so well as that first game began that they might have just gone on and won the Stanley Cup in the first period. Methinks it's a tad early to be going out on that limb right now. In Boston, it was not pretty for the Rangers. They don't look like they belong in the same rink as the Bruins as they were pounded by Boston by an 8-2 count that actually flattered the hapless Rangers. If the Rangers don't get their act together soon, and by soon, I mean over one of the next two games, this one could be over in four straight. Phil Esposito scored three times for the Bruins in that game, and Bobby Orr added a pair, but what really crushed the Rangers was a couple of shorthanded goals by the Bruins within just 44 seconds that changed the flow of the entire game. In St. Louis, the Blues cruised to a 6-2 win over the Minnesota North Stars 
Ab McDonald and Terry Crisp paced the Blues attack with two goals apiece, and Jacques Plant was given outstanding protection to have an easy night between the pipes for the Blues. The North Stars are going to really have to improve if they have even a ghost of a chance against St. Louis. And in what should be the closest series, it was the closest game of that first night with the Penguins managing to slip by the visiting Oakland Seals by a 2-1 score before a crowd of 8,051 fans in Pittsburgh. Nick Harbrook, who scored only five goals for the entire season for Pittsburgh, potted the winner for the Penguins with just over seven minutes left to play, but the play was not without controversy. Seals goalie Gary Smith felt that Pittsburgh's Glenn Sather had interfered with him on the play and he immediately left the net to inform referee Bruce Hood of that fact. Hood wasn't listening though. He allowed the goal and skated away turning his back to Smith who chased him to center ice. Smith followed all the way to the almost to the uh, referee's crease yelling and screaming at uh, Hood the whole time. Finally, he took off his mask, threw it across the rink, but Bruce Hood, to his credit, chose to ignore Smith's tirade. He allowed him and the game to continue. The very next evening, all the teams were at it again, and all four first-game winners repeated their successes in the game number two, Pitt Martin's goal at 15:20 of the final period snapped a 2-2 tie and proved to be the winner as Chicago defeated Detroit by a 4-2 score for the second night in a row. The Rangers made it a little closer, but the Bruins again were far the superior team as they came from behind to dump New York by a score of 5-3. Nick Harbrook suddenly turning into a scoring machine scored along with Wally Boyer just 34 seconds apart in the second period and that was enough to power the Penguins past the Seals by a score 3-1 and goals by Gary Sabrin and Phil Goyette gave St. Louis a narrow 2-1 victory over the North Stars but it wasn't really that close it was only the goalkeeping by Minnesota netminder Cesar Maniego who kept the score respectable as the Blues outshot the North Stars in that one, 49-18. So the teams had just one day off on Friday before moving on to games three and four in each series on Saturday and Sunday in the third and fourth place cities in each division. The four winners of the first two games of each series all had dreams of four-game sweeps to gain some much-needed recovering time for the big finals, uh, division finals, that is. Now, would anyone be able to pull off a sweep? Well, the answer wasn't long in coming. It wasn't going to be Boston in their series with New York, that's for sure. The friendly confines of Madison Square Garden were just what the Rangers needed as the Broadway Blue Shirts eked out a 4-3 win over the Bruins in a game in which New York had a strategy to manhandle the Bruins in a very uncustomary Ranger way. Emotions were running high between the two teams and right off the opening face-off, the Rangers seemed to be taking runs at everything, especially Bruins center Derek Sanderson, who was ejected in early, early in the first period. And we have a little bit of the audio on what happened with Sanderson there. Jackman skated right out to the face-off circle and started to jaw with Sanderson. Now Sanderson throwing a warning finger toward the Rangers bench. As a few remarks came out from there. Shot by Marcotte. Goes behind the New York net as Brad Park throws a good check on Marcotte. Puck loose in the corner. Sanderson double teamed and here we go. Everyone on the ice piles on. Sanderson is on the bottom as the Rangers have ganged up on Derek Sanderson. Marcotte's trying to tear him apart. Sanderson still throwing from both sides. Marcotte's got a hold of Kachuk. Now Kachuk has him backed up against the board. Sanderson still flailing away. Kachuk was on one side, and I believe it was Brad Park on the other side. They just ganged up on them and started hitting them one from either side. Well, sir, if this series does return to Boston, that should be a most interesting game Tuesday night. Westfall holding off one man. Now Kachuk goes after him again. 
The Bruins perched on the edge of the dasher at their side of the rink. Rangers still try to get something rolling here in the corner. There's Arnie Brown. It would seem apparent the plan of attack was to wear Derek Sanderson out right off the right off the uh, the opening bell, and this could take its toll on Boston. Now D'Amico brings Sanderson over to the Boston bench and is talking with. Now Sanderson, Harry Sinden has erupted. I would guess that Ashley has assessed a game misconduct to Derek Sanderson. The Bruins actually planned on lodging a formal protest with NHL President Clarence Campbell about the Rangers allegedly telling Sanderson that they had put a bounty on his head and they were out to get him. You remember in this sound clip that Eddie Jockerman had left the net to say something to Sanderson. Sanderson claimed that Jockerman told him that they were being paid to knock his head off, and that's why he made the hand gestures to the New York bench. Jockerman denied using those words. He simply said that he told Derek to keep his head up, a right neighborly thing to do at this time of the year, I would think. For the third straight game in the series between the Blackhawks and the Red Wings, the final score was 4-2, to two, and for the third straight game, it was Chicago on the long side of that score. Somehow, they crammed over 15,000 fans into the Detroit Olympia for this game. It was complete with octopi and all other sorts of debris on the ice, but that wasn't going to help the Red Wings. They're not going to do much against Chicago. It's now 3 nothing for the Blackhawks. St. Louis and Minnesota took their series to Minnesota, and it was brilliant goalkeeping by good old Gump Worsley that led the North Stars to a surprise 4-2 win over the Blues. Bill Goldsworthy, feeling the effects of a, a few minor injuries, was still the scoring hero for Minnesota as he netted a pair of goals as the North Stars are trying to make a series of it, and there might be a few cracks in that St. Louis uh, foundation. And out on the West Coast in Oakland, the Penguins took a commanding 3 nothing lead in their series with the Seals, posting a 5-2 victory. Veteran winger Kenny Schinkel was the most dangerous of the Penguins as he scored a hat trick, and it was another good game for Penguins veteran goalie Les Binkley playing, as we said, in his first Stanley Cup playoff series, and he isn't about to let this opportunity slip by with about 100% effort, and actually he gave even a little more than that, if that's even possible. So Sunday evening, we saw that we had two series potentially coming to an end, and two more series could end up being tied at 2-2. That's exactly what happened. Chicago again defeated Detroit, Fourth time in a row, the score was 4-2 to two to send the Red Wings to the golf course. And when have we ever had any series go four games and have all the scores being exactly the same? Of course, right after the game, Red Wings coach Sid Abel became former coach Sid Abel as he resigned the position, but he does retain his general manager chair. Now, the Chicago win was a quite unremarkable for a playoff match against a Detroit squad that just seemed to want to get things over with, and that's exactly what they did. At Madison Square Garden in New York City, the Rangers and Bruins were continuing a series that resembled more of guerrilla warfare than it did of playoff hockey. Although there was a good deal of hockey played as well, the Rangers surprisingly tied the series up at two games each, and who were to predict that after game one, with a solid 4-2 win over the Bruins, with Rod Gilbert living up to his star status, scoring twice for the Rangers. The North Stars really shocked the Blues to tie their series at 2-2. They blanked the St. Louis squad by a score of 4 nothing. Now, Coach Charlie Burns' strategy has been to alternate goalies Cesar Maniego and Gump Worsley. And that worked again tonight was Maniego made 34 saves to shut out the Blues after Worsley had started in the previous evening. Bill Goldsworthy scored his fourth goal of the playoffs in the first period and that was all the offense that Minnesota would need. 
And the Penguins completed their sweep of the Oakland Seals out on the West Coast. It was Michelle Briere's first ever playoff goal that uh, was the difference in this game. What a big goal it was. It came at 8.28 of the first overtime to give Pittsburgh a 3-2 win and the series sweep. And Michelle Briere became the first Pittsburgh Penguins player to score a series-winning overtime goal. And all anyone could talk about after that game was what a great future this kid has. So as our week this week comes to an end, we have two series all done with the Blackhawks eliminating the Red Wings by four identical scores of 4-2. And we have the Seals going to the golf course after falling to Pittsburgh in four straight as well. The other two series, both quite surprisingly, I think, are knotted at two games apiece and they'll be decided next next week and we'll have all the details for you. Will the Bruins and Blackhawks play for the Eastern Crown as it seemed to have meant to have been uh, taking place all year or would the Rangers be able to pull off a major upset and then take on Chicago and you gotta wonder if the North Stars can keep it up against the Blues the way the North Stars goalkeeping has been anything is possible in that series I'm sure if you know anything about uh, hockey history you've probably heard the NHL being called by a rather derogatory term, the Norris House League. Ever wonder why the NHL was uh, given that nickname for so many years? Well, get a load of this mess. And this actually happened in the Chicago-Detroit series this year. And our source for this is no less than Jack Barry, the fine Detroit Free Press hockey writer. Now, Jack writes that to accommodate an old family friend, the Red Wings owner, Bruce Norris, moved against the wishes of his coach and general manager and the interests of his old his own team. The, he's a millionaire boss of the Red Wings. You know that Bruce is the brother of former Chicago owner Jim Norris, who passed away a few years ago. The Blackhawks president, Arthur Wirtz, who used to be Jim Norris's partner, he requested that the Red Wings game against Detroit be switched from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday. The switch was made to satisfy Chicago uh, TV station, which televises Blackhawk road games. The station already had scheduled a telecast for Saturday afternoon of the Chicago Cubs and the Montreal Expos. That was for 2 p.m., which is right about the time that the hockey game was supposed to take place. So moving the game to a late evening would put a heavy burden on both hockey teams. But Wirtz, of course, figured his Hawks, a little stronger than the Red Wings, would be able to handle it. So the fourth game of the series was scheduled for 1 p.m. Sunday, meaning a short switch between games. It also meant, unfortunately for Detroit area fans, that if they didn't have tickets to the game or tickets to a closed circuit broadcast, they wouldn't be able to see the hockey game at all. CKLW TV Channel 9 in Windsor had scheduled the telecast of the Boston New York quarterfinal game but that game now had to be blacked out and wouldn't even be able to be shown until 11 p.m. because the Chicago Detroit game was on and under the NHL rules if there's a game in Detroit the Windsor stations are blacked out so Red Wing fans thanks to the whim of their owner won't even be able to see a live hockey game on Saturday night. The Chicago-Detroit game would be shown on closed circuit TV at, of all places, the Masonic Temple in Detroit and at the Toledo Sports Arena in Toledo, Ohio. The tickets were $5 each in Toledo, and uh, there were about 4,600 reserved seats at the Masonic Temple and about 7,400 general admission tickets in Toledo. Now, the Sunday game was to be televised nationally, and when it was, it was selected as the network game by CBS. Now, the Red Wing manager, Coach Sid Abel, decided to play the Saturday game in the afternoon as well when CBS made that decision, 
But now Bruce Norris has thrown a monkey wrench into that plan. And of course, the losers in this are Detroit hockey fans who, thanks to some ungodly allegiance to his chief rival in Chicago, they're being blacked out. That's why they called the NHL the Norris House League. What a mess that was. And we have one other hockey story this week, but this one has nothing to do with the intense competition of the Stanley Cup playoffs, but it does have uh, to do with the intensity of hockey, and it sort of reveals the human side of our sport, and that's a side we so often miss as fans and reporters of the games. Ron Ellis is a 25-year-old right winger and a very, very good hockey player. He led the Toronto Maple Leafs in scoring this season with 35 goals, and that was the best year so far in Ron's brief career. But for Ron's personal success doesn't mean that much. He considered this his most miserable of all the hockey seasons he has played in the first 25 years he spent on planet Earth. Even as Ron has developed into one of the National Hockey League's best right wingers, he spoke of not enjoying the game anymore right after the season. Ron freely admits he's depressed about all this, and he says that the Maple Leaf sixth place finish is not the only reason for his depression. Ron said, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. It's just that I'm not sure about hockey anymore. I don't enjoy it like I did my first couple of seasons. Ron went on to say it's just not something that he wanted to spend 15 years of his life on. Ron's plan has always been to play hockey until he was 30 and then return to what he had always wanted to do, which is teach school. Ron's been working towards a university degree while playing for the Leafs, and he thinks that that has contributed to his current situation. Ron uh, said, uh, that's where I made my mistake this year. Take an economics course during the season. And if you've ever studied economics in university, that's not what they call a bird course. That's one lot of work for a person. Now, Ron said, I thought it might help. It might take my mind off of all the games by taking the university course. Instead, Ron says, he ended up with two things on his mind his game, and of course, the university course. Ron said that at times he felt overwhelmed, and for a while, neither his hockey or the university studies were going well. He said that's when he felt his lowest. Now, Ron says, I still think you should be able to play hockey and take a course at the same time. But Ron says he can't do it properly, doing both things at once. He says he doesn't have the concentration. Ron said that he's not the only player who's combined hockey and university courses, naming Britt Selby, Brian Glennie, and Mike Pellick as others who have engaged in the same activity. Ron will continue to study this summer, and he's only going to take a bit of time off for a couple of brief periods at a couple of hockey camps. And he's also going to work at the summer resort that he runs with his dad at Sand Lake near Huntsville, Ontario. Now, Ron's dad, by the way, is uh, quite a guy and quite a hockey player. And I had the pleasure of playing against uh, Mr. Ellis. I believe his first name is Randy in an old old timers hockey tournament in Toronto quite a few late years later. That guy could get rid of the puck as fast as anybody I've ever seen. And he took a shot on me once when I was playing goal and I didn't move. The puck went right into my glove. He came over to me and congratulated me on a nice save, and I had to admit to him, I never even saw it. Well, Ron says he's going to be back with the Maple Leafs next season, and he just hopes that he can get in a better frame of mind. Uh, He plans on foregoing outside distractions like university so he can concentrate on hockey full time. Now, a few years later, I actually got to know Ron as well through my good friend Teeter Kennedy. Teeter was invited to an, uh, a Maple Leaf alumni dinner, and Ron actually got my, my phone number from Paul Patsko, a hockey historian in Toronto, and he gave Ron my number, and Ron called me and asked me if I could convince Teeter to come to the Maple Leaf alumni dinner, which, of course, how could you say no to Ron Ellis? Uh, so we... Uh, 
talked to Teeter, who agreed to go when he was uh, told just how badly the other players wanted him there. And we had quite a nice dinner with Ron Ellis and everyone else in the Maple Leaf Alumni uh, offices. Anyway, I visited Ron as well at his Hockey Hall of Fame office a few times. He's a good man and has always been quite candid about uh, the depression that's bothered him through his life. And uh, he's accomplished a lot in his career despite that handicap that none of us could even see or realize what was hampering him at the time. I'm glad he was able to stick around in the NHL for a few good more years and appreciate all the times he provided Maple Leaf fans despite the Maple Leaf team's lack of success on the ice. So that is our show this week, boys and girls, and we've had a lot of fun in the Stanley Cup playoffs to start with, with a lot more action to come. So what have we learned in this week's show? Well, we saw how the Stanley Cup finals were starting off after the first four games, and we learned a bit about how things in Montreal and Toronto were looking as they're on the outside looking in at the Stanley Cup playoffs. And we learned a bit more about one of hockey's really good guys, Ronnie Ellis of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Some of the stories we're working on next week will cover some injuries that strike the National Hockey League officiating staff. We'll learn about the outcome of that wild Bruin Rangers series and how it had become a real war. And we'll learn that the Red Wings wasted little time in hiring a new coach to replace the very experienced Sid Abel, replacing him with a man with no professional hockey experience. Please join us next week for another 50-year trip back in time to 1970. The 50 Years Ago on Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole, and I can't thank him enough for everything he does for this podcast. Very popular Juno-nominated Toronto Windy Rock group, the Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our intro and exit music, and other cult musical pieces are provided by Andy Cole. Our research comes from files in the Toronto Star, Toronto Globe and Mail, and of course the many publications found at newspapers.com. Don't forget to give a listen to the Let's Write a Song podcast. Everybody should have a little more time on their hands these days, and Andy Cole's show is really something interesting to listen to. Every week, he and a special guest, who's not always a musician, engage in great conversations and write a song which they perform at the end of the show and the results are really quite unique you can find us on twitter at at hockey 50 years and on facebook under the 50 years ago in hockey banner and at our wordpress site hockey 50 years ago.com you can get the podcast through your pay- favorite podcast app and of course on the google and apple podcast stores we thank everyone who tunes into the show. We'll be talking about our off-season very shortly, and we have some really fine features lined up for that. On that note, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.